Good morning, Mount Carmel Christian Church friends and family. We are so glad that you're here with us, whether you're here live, whether you're joining us online, and a special shout out to our international worshipers online from South Korea, India, Italy, and the United Kingdom. We are so glad that you're joining us for worship this morning. My name is Tim Peace, and I'm the teaching minister here at Mount Carmel Christian Church. And I just wanted to share two things before we uh, start off uh, with worship in song this morning. The first thing is this. Uh, we have an event tonight at 6 p.m. called Kid Splash. And Kid Splash is an opportunity for parents and their children to learn about baptism. So if you have a, a child that has been asking questions about baptism, asking questions about what it means to be a Christian, we encourage you uh, to join us at 6 p.m. tonight for that class. I know it's the day of, but you can still register, so if you would like to do that, please go to mountcarmelchurch.org, click on events, and you'll find Kid Splash registration. You can click through and do that and be here at 6 p.m. tonight. The second thing is this. We just wanted to take a moment to celebrate. We had a really outstanding uh, service opportunity that happened on Friday. As a church here at Mount Carmel, we partner with a ministry called Inner Parish Ministries. And we, we do this on a regular basis uh, where we uh, get to help out families that have a little bit of need going on right now. And so uh, this time, what we got to do is we got to help serve 68 local families by giving them food, and we actually distributed 170 backpacks uh, on Friday uh, to these families in need. And the cool thing is this, we get to do this thanks to the generosity of our church body here at Mount Carmel. Um, your generosity has helped us to be able to continue, uh, not only to support ministries such as Inner Parish, but it also allows us to uh, serve in specific projects uh, like this on a regular basis. So thank you for your generosity. Keep it up. And just wanted to take a moment to celebrate that. Right now, I'm going to turn things over to our worship team. And we are going to worship in song. So please stand and join them in singing. Thanks, Tim. It's great to see all of you in person and those of you online. Welcome. I want to worship the Lord with you today. God loves you so much. And I know it's just wonderful to be back in the same place with all of you, focusing on the same thing. And that's giving God glory, lifting up the name of Jesus so he can draw all men to himself. Let's worship together.
Old things have passed away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains the cornerstone. Things that
Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We love him because he first loved us and gave his life as a ransom for many. So this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Praise you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for making a way where there was no way for paying the price that you didn't need to pay, that you didn't deserve to pay. But you loved us so much, you paid it anyway. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yesterday, today, and forever on to eternity. We love you, Lord. We humble ourselves in your presence. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us so much to give your life for ours. In your precious name we pray. Amen.
Thank you for being with us today and uh, joining us together. We're together in person and we have the opportunity to be together online. Purpose of gathering as a church is uh, first of all to uh, worship God in one voice, to be reminded that God has saved us to be part of a community, uh, a family of faith by which we are able to serve him, to proclaim together the things that unify us, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Holy Spirit, one purpose, one mission. We're also together uh, to fulfill what the Hebrew writer says in his encouragement to Christians when he says, don't forsake the gathering, but instead gather together with the intent to uh, spur one another, to motivate one another to love and good deeds. And uh, you are here so that you might share a gift from God that will bless another. As uh, you've already seen, my name is Didi Bacon. I'm the senior minister here. And I'm thrilled that you're just chosen to join us for our time as we continue on journeying through the sermon series that uh, you saw the graphic for there in a few minutes ago, sermon series entitled Brave. So uh, someone from the church uh, gave me a book. I love good books. And they gave me a book by a man named Ravi Zacharias. I, I, someone said it's Ravi Zacharias, and I say it's Ravi Zacharias, but Ravi, Ravi, potato, tomato, you know what I'm saying. Um, Ravi Zacharias, it's called The Grand Weaver, how God uses the circumstances of our lives to shape us. And I've really been enjoying that. Um, those of you that are aware of Ravi Zacharias, his ministry, his work, will know that he passed away this year, I believe. And uh, I think we've lost uh, someone who has been uh, quite articulate and uh, quite brave in engaging our culture and conversing from a Christian perspective, from a truth-based perspective from the scriptures and really being able to proclaim Christ. I knew Ravi was born in India, and, but what I did know was that Ravi, like me, has a passion for cricket. Cricket's a game that's played all over the world, where particularly where the British colony was. And you're like, what kind of game could it be that's named after an insect? Uh, we won't get into that, but cricket was one of my, my passions. And Ravi Zacharias loves cricket. I didn't know that. In fact, you find it out really quickly in the introduction to the book that I'm reading, The Grand Weaver, where he talks about a time that he was in South Africa. And in South Africa, they play cricket. And at the time he was there, South Africa's national team was playing cricket against the West Indies. The Caribbean islands uh, put together a team called the West Indies, and they also play cricket. And so he was there during that time doing a lecture tour. As it happened, the manager in the story that he shares, the manager of the South African cricket team was a newly converted Christian, and he came to hear Ravi speak. And, met Ravi and invited Ravi to come and enjoy a game, finding out that Ravi likes cricket. And so Ravi took the opportunity to watch a cricket game between West Indies and, Indi uh, and South Africa. And in the course of their conversation, the man began to share his story with Ravi about how he became a Christian. You see, he said, I was uh, quite skeptical. In fact, not quite skeptical. I was uh, hostile towards God and towards people of faith. One Sunday, I was sitting out by my pool drinking a beer, and it happened to be Easter Sunday, and I heard on the TV hymns being played, Christian hymns, Easter-related hymns being played, and as I was sitting there, I kind of offhandedly, snarkedly said, well, if you're real, show yourself to me. And he said it, he said, I said it more as a taunt than really a request. But after a time, he was sitting out there by the pool, and all of a sudden, he took notice about something strange happening on the surface of the pool. All of a sudden, in the surface of the pool, he noticed that out of it formed the face of Jesus. Freaked out, he figured it must be the beer. <laughs> and, uh, and so he didn't think of anything of it, went to bed. Next morning, woke up. And when he woke up, he looked at his door to his room, and all of a sudden, he noticed in the wood grain of the door the same face of Jesus. 
He got up and he started moving around his house and he said every door he looked at, he saw the same face. In fact, he was so freaked out, he said, I didn't want to look at any more doors. Message received. And the manager of the South African cricket team gave his life to God, a God who was willing to do what needed to be done in order to get his attention to bring him to a place where he gave his life to Jesus. Now, I've been reflecting on that story, and uh, one thing that struck me is, you know, when God moves in our lives, when God does something like that, we're not shy in telling others about it, are we? I mean, this man was not shy in telling Ravi Zacharias the story, and I can guarantee he was not shy in telling the story to other people he had opportunity to. There is a direct correlation between the work of God in our lives and our bold proclamation of our faith and our brave faith. When God is at work in our lives, it's easy for us to be brave. It's, it's motivational for us to, to speak out on what God is doing. And I thought about this story, and I thought about the connection between brave faith and, and the work of God. And I began to ask myself, well, how is it that I don't hear too many of these stories in my circle of friends and my church and amongst the, the Christians that I hang out with? And quite honestly, how is it that I don't share stories too often about these kinds of things, about God at work in my life? In fact, I began to realize that, you know, a lot of times what I talk about is usually stuff that happened way back in my past, not way back, I'm not that old, <laughs> uh, but back in my past, in which when I was a younger Christian, primarily, uh, I was so aware of God's work that, that I was talking about it more regularly because I saw God uh, working and, and I was not afraid to share it. But now that I've been a Christian in a while, uh, I don't see that as much. What's going on? Is God not working anymore? Is God not active in my life anymore? Wh what's happening? Once I began to think about it more, another thought that's been with me for a while now, a thought that's, that I've been chewing on after reading another book some time ago. There's a saying that says, you only see what you look at. In fact, that's how we are as human beings, right? Our eyes are designed to only see what we give attention to. We, we don't have the unique ability of really being able to focus anything else beyond that. And in fact, psychologically, we only see what we look at. How many of us have been thinking about buying a car and all of a sudden we're thinking about buying a car and then we drive around and guess what? We see the car everywhere, right? We see the car that we want to buy everywhere. Why? Because we, we see what we look at. In fact, uh, experiments have been conducted where uh, people have been told to focus on, on two people talking or something like that. They're told to focus on a, a certain subject. And in the experiment, the experimenters will have a, a man in a gorilla suit actually run behind the subject and be around. And a lot of people don't even see the gorilla. Why? Because we see what we look at. And I have to say that maybe, and I've been convicted, that maybe I'm not seeing God at work because I've stopped looking for it. I've stopped looking for Him. I've stopped opening my eyes and being, being aware of His promptings. And maybe that's something that is happening with you as well. Maybe the issue is not that God's stopped working. Maybe the issue is that I've stopped looking for Him, and instead I began to expect not uh, where is God working, but instead I've been, been able to start saying, well, this is where I'm working, and I want God to join me here. Maybe I've began to operate with the thought that it's not uh, will I be with God. No, it's God needs to be with me. And when that happens, then we actually will stop seeing God working because Following Jesus is just that, following Jesus. There's a passage in Scripture that I'd like for us to pay attention to that I think gives us a roadmap that hopefully will challenge all of us to 
be able to train ourselves to see God at work so that we might have the resulting brave and bold faith in our day to day. The story from the book of Acts chapter 3. Book of Acts chapter 3, the church is newly established. Peter and John, we're told, two of the apostles, two of the leaders of the church, one day decide to go to prayer at 3 o'clock in the temple. As they approach one of the gates into the temple, the gate known as Gate Beautiful, they see a man laying there. This man has been coming to that place year after year. He's well known to everyone that travels into the temple to worship. He's well known. His story is that he's a man that was born lame. He was a man that was born crippled. And so what his, his lot in life, because he couldn't work, was to beg. And so this man would be laid there at the gate of the temple to beg and ask for help for those who were coming in to worship God. And notice this too, that he was not allowed to go beyond the gate. Why? Because it was not allowed for people with infirmities and crippling, uh, those who were crippled, to go into the place where you worship God. Only people who were whole, Jews who were whole, could go into the, to that place where you could have access to worship God. And so there he was on the outside begging, begging. Now, some of you may remember the little song that we used to sing in Sunday school. Peter and John went to pray. They met a layman on the way. What did the layman do? He held out his palm and asked for an arm. And this is what Peter did say. He asked for money, and Peter says, I love this in the Scripture. You always got to catch the humorous things in the Bible because they're always fun. Peter goes, look at us. Now, I don't know what he meant. They, maybe they look terrible. Maybe it's like, hey, look at us. Do we look like we got money? Do we look like we're loaded? Come on. Look at us. We have no money, but what I'm going to give to you, what I'm going to do is respond to the opportunity of God at work. And it says he reached out his hand and he grabbed the man and said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I now lift you up, rise up and walk. And what does the song say? He went walking and leaping and praising God, right? Walking and leaping and praising God. Some of you don't know the song. Maybe I shouldn't sing. <laughs> the Bible says the man is healed and he goes into the temple. He goes into the temple. Now he's allowed as one who is made whole to enter in to have access to the worship of God. And so we're going to pick up the story right here in chapter uh, 3, verse 11. Follow along with me. It says, while the man held on to Peter and John... People were astonished and came running to them. Why were they astonished? Because everyone knew this guy. Everyone knew his story. Hey, you know that dude that was a years and years and years, a cripple, his legs all mangled and unusable, that used to lay at the, at the front of the gate? He's in the temple with these two other guys dancing around and praising God. you got to come and see that. That's what was happening, right? So while the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. It's a, it's a location within the temple walls where people went to pray. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, Jews, have glorified his servant Jesus, you handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he wanted, had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released. Remember Barabbas? You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you all can see. Peter takes the opportunity to proclaim Jesus because of the miracle, the work of God that occurred in their midst. Now, you, you see this, and you, I, I ask the question, okay, well, what happened there? Is that applicable to my life now? I mean, I'm not an apostle, and apostles were uniquely gifted by God with supernatural power to do things that not the average Christian is, is called to do in order to establish the church. The apostles were given unique authority in order to set up the church of Jesus Christ. 
And so while I can say I, I don't have those, those, those powers of the apostles, uh, what I do have is the same Holy Spirit dwelling in me who is gifting me to fulfill ministry opportunities that God provides. So just like Peter and John, I have the Spirit of God within me available to resource when I identify God at work, when I see an opportunity provided in order to do ministry. If you do a study of the spiritual gifts, you see every one of those spiritual gifts are gifts given by God for those who are open to do ministry in the name of Jesus for the benefit and the blessing of others and the honor of the God who calls us. And so like Peter and John, God provides opportunities for me to respond and to say yes. And when I say yes, I join God in his work. I've often said this from the stage. There are two parts to grace, right? The first part of grace is that God makes us his kids through faith in Jesus. The second part is that he invites us into the family business. The question is, is are we willing to join him there? We like to say, I'm not afraid because God is with me. Well, a more accurate statement needs to be this. I'm not afraid because I am with God. Do you see the difference there? And so we see that this, this model provides us really a framework that we can see that can be applied to our life. I like how Henry Blackaby puts it, frames it in his book, Experiencing God. He says, here's two basic questions that each of us needs to, to ask as Jesus follows. And I'm going to add a third piece that goes to our conversation regarding brave faith. The first question is, is this. We need to orientate our lives as Jesus follows, asking the question, where is God working? First thing in the morning when you wake up and you say your prayers, or whenever you say your prayers, I know for me, it typically jumps into my agenda, my needs, and the things that I want. I've been personally challenged to say, wait, I've got to put a time out on that. While that stuff is, is good for me to share as I, I work through the things that are my heart, God asked me to, to speak to him in prayer on the things that, that, that are burdening me and things that I have in front of me and my, my commitments of my day-to-day. -day, the first things I need to say is make, take a pause and say, God, where are you working? Help me see where you're working. Help me be aware of the prompts that you are placing in my life in order to step into opportunities that you provide me in my unique God assignments day to day to follow you. It's an orientation of openness and submission. It's a saying, look, I don't drive this bus. I'm handing it over to you, and I'm going to be open to where you lead. Second question, where is God working? The next question is then, when I identify where he's working, how can I be with him? This is where it's a matter of faith and trust. Sometimes we say, well, God's working in this. I believe this is an opportunity, but I don't feel qualified. I don't feel like I can do it. Well, this is where we need to step up. This is where God's resources step in. Many times God will call us to his work not to act on the things that we have within ourselves, but instead to rely on him. And he gives us, he resources us, to fulfill it. Peter says, it's not us that brought about this healing, but it's our faith in Jesus who was raised from the dead. Well, that's exactly where we need to be. It's not me who's doing this, but Jesus working through me, who I rely on in order to respond to the invitation to work with God. Where's God working? How can I be with him? And then finally, when I am there at that place, I need to say, make the commitment, then I'm going to tell others about what God is doing. Now, I'm telling you, when God is at work in your life, it will attract the attention of someone. It might be one, or it might be a number of someones, but it's going to attract the attention, and it's up to us in that moment to not be afraid to say what Peter and John said. This is Jesus. This is the work of God. This is the testimony of the resurrected Christ, and to do it bravely. Now, if you know the story in chapter 3, you'll know that Peter and John are making this proclamation, and all of a sudden the guards are sent by, by the ruling authorities, the Sanhedrin in the temple. They, they say, well, you guys are saying stuff that is not, not favorable to us. They bring him to court. They bring him before trial. And Peter and John don't stop. They keep on proclaiming the truth boldly. And in fact, they come to the point of saying, hey, you guys are telling us not to talk about Jesus anymore, but you decide. 
Come on. Put, a, put yourselves in our shoes. Which is it better, to obey you or to obey God? I think you know what we're going to do. We're going to be obeying God. See ya, right? I don't know if they did the see ya thing, but... So I've been wrestling with this and really trying to put to practice what I'm preaching here. And I've been daily asking myself, where is God working? How can I be with him? And how can I talk about it? And I brought that to one of my staff meetings, uh, an executive meeting, meeting with uh, Arlen Howard and Rick Anderson and Jeff Perrine. And we were, we were discussing strategy stuff for the church. We were discussing... Uh, you know, kind of putting the framework of things that we're talking about ministry-wise here at Mount Carmel. And I said, we, before we do get into the details of what we think, we need to stop and ask the question, where is God working? And where specifically do we see God working at Mount Carmel Christian Church at a time like this, in this season? And so we listened to one another, we prayerfully investigated into that uh, answer to that question, and, 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 and it all came to me uh, in a list of seven things that I see right now where God is working through our church in this season. And it just happened that all seven things began with the letter P. I don't know, it just happened. That's how it works. It's my strange brain. But let me share with you some of them. Let me share with you them. And, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, but hopefully this gives you a glimpse of where I see God working. First of all, I see God working through personal connection. I heard a preacher who was talking about his story of recovering from nearly dying from COVID. He said something really interesting and powerful. He said, you know, we think that the opposite of deep is shallow. But he said, what I've come to discover is that the opposite of shallow is not deep. I'm flipping around. It's personal. When things become personal, they get deep for us, right? When we're talking about people suffering, uh, we may talk about it, but if it's someone we love and know suffering from something, then it becomes really deep and we become really passionate about it. And through this ordeal, through this season, what I've seen is that people are making an investments in the personal more and more. Personal connection. Families are appreciating time together with their kids because they have to be in and making that investment. Friends are appreciating their friendship more uh, because now they realize, hey, we need to talk about things not trivial but things that matter. There's, there's an increase in an awareness of the fact that, that God has called each of us to make investments in those whom he assigns to us in relationship and make those investments and not mess around with fluff and, and distraction, but, but really seek to minister to people in a personal, deep way with the things that matter. I've seen the rise of personal con connection in my, in my discipleship groups and in my conversations with other Jesus followers and Christians and in the church. Second, prayer. Prayer. During this season, I've seen more Mount Carmel people pray than ever before. The list of people sending in requests are, are long and deep, and our folks are praying, and I know you're praying, and we are doing what we need to do, going exactly how we need to respond at a time like this, on our knees, honoring uh, the call to speak to God regarding the things that are far greater than ourselves. We're praying more. Pruning. I don't know about you, but personally, I feel like I'm being pruned. What's a pruning? Pruning is cutting away the dead wood in order to invigorate new growth. And these times have been challenging. Challenging in faith, challenging in perspective, challenging in, in shaking the things that we thought were, were certain, and now all of a sudden we realize, whoa, wait, wait a minute, maybe that wasn't as important or special as I thought. Maybe I did have idols that I didn't recognize that I was paying more attention to than following God. And so I've seen a personal pruning. I've seen a pruning within our church community, within our church, where people are, are making the decision, am I in or am I not, when it comes to the mission that Christ calls us as a church. People of color. Throughout all this and with all the craziness that are going on, I, we've become increasingly aware of the opportunity to minister to folks that are different than us. 
I'm particularly excited to, to hear the story of, of our, our efforts to reach the Latino community and, and, and just the work that's been happening. It's, it's going slower, but it's becoming significant as God is providing us opportunities to connect with Latino folk within our community, bringing to them the message of Christ based upon personal connection. There it is. Practical help to our community. Tim shared about how we had the honor to serve alongside with Interparish Ministries. It's been good to see uh, the partnerships that we've been able to, to have in, in our community, in Caring Place, the group that went out and helped them on their, their facilities to, to get things together, opportunities to serve. I, I just love the stories that I hear of individuals that are stepping up to help neighbors, to help folks that are in need, to respond to those who are struggling with practical help for our community to support schools and to, and to help with, with neighbors. Platform and pipeline ministry. Let me take a little moment here. Those of you that are in the IT world understand this notion of platform. A platform is a setup where you basically provide the, uh, something where someone has a need and someone has the ability to meet need and a platform is what connects the two so that the one with the, with the need can, can receive the gift from the one that can provide for the need. Does that make sense? So let me give you an example. Um, pipeline basically means that, that basically refers to the fact that everyone comes together and we do it all together. It's, it's a centralized effort approach where we all pool our resources, if you'd like, to pursue one thing or a couple of things. Well, this whole thing has brought us a realization that as a church, we have opportunity to do platform and pipeline ministry together. Let me give you an example of what this looks like. Vacation Bible School. Do you know we had Vacation Bible School this summer? In Vacation Bible School, we had 10 locations in which individuals from our, our congregation said, yes, you can facilitate a Vacation Bible School in my backyard, and you can invite friends from the community who will come and provide a vacation Bible school, kids learning about Jesus' experience. The people that came to do that were folks from the church, but they also they were provided a toolbox, if you'd like, in order to do that. You have platform, a need, and then the pipeline, vacation Bible school, all coming together. Is that making sense to you? I'm seeing us as a church begin to see a fulfillment of what God calls us to be the church, that individuals are stepping up, taking responsibility for the calling that God has placed on their lives, not waiting to, oh, I'm going to wait for the church to do that, but instead responding and say, yes, count on me. And then the church, us as a community, coming around them to support them in that calling. God's working in that. People are taking ownership of their faith more and more through this experience. And we as a church then can come around them as a collective to support and facilitate that. Finally, passion for faith in Jesus. Again, this all connects. But I'm seeing more people become passionate in their faith for Jesus. More passionate in living out for Christ in their day to day. We've come to learn that church is not an event on Sunday. Right? We've come to realize that church is a day-to-day -day commitment of asking, where are you working, Lord? How can I be with you? And I'm going to tell others. And what we do on Sunday, what we do on Sunday is a celebration of that. The small of our day-to-day -day energizes the big celebration coming together on Sunday. Passion for faith in Jesus. That's why I see... God working through our church in this season while we're continuing to pursue the mission of making disciples, Jesus follows who make Jesus follows. Where's God working? How can I join him in that work? I'll tell others about that work. I'm going to encourage you to maybe mull on those questions. Make that your prayer. Remember the story of Peter and John who went to pray and the lame man on the way who asked for an arm, held in his palm and asked for an arm. Remember that? Acts 3. And in that, 
Remind yourself, where's God working? How can I join him? I'll tell others. Well, those of you at home and those of you that are here, it's time for us to uh, kind of come things together with a communion time. For those of you that are Jesus followers, this is something that's significant. If you are unaware of what this means and you're like, mm, I'm still investigating, that's okay. Sit tight. But what this means is we take out the bread, and uh, I say I encourage you to shake the, the juice. Apparently it tastes better afterwards. <laughs> But take out the bread and the juice, and I want you, we're going to take these together and remember what they mean. What they mean is that God has made a way for us to be right through faith in Jesus who died on the cross. And so we take the bread to remember his body on the cross. We take the juice to remember his blood shed on the cross. Pray with me, please. Lord, thanks for this time that we can share together. Pray your blessing on all that are here and those who have joined us online. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us. Lord, help us to learn how to be open to your working. Give us the courage, the wisdom, the gifting to join you in that work. And help us to, to share that boldly with others. Lord, pray that our lives may be daily witnesses to your work. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So glad you're here with us. Uh, remember, we have uh, prayer cards that are available for you to fill out that you can put into the receptacle out there in the foyer. If you have a gift, an offering to give, that can go in there as well. Those folks online, we have an online response card, online prayer response. You can fill that out, send it to us. We will be uh, praying for you on that, as well as uh, online giving. You can respond in that way. Uh, good to see everyone. Live out a brave faith in Jesus.